千里之行，始于足下。A journey of a thousand miles begins beneath the feet. We now gather in the Tao to travel the journey together. 
a variety of mental health conditions, um, as is typically psychotherapy. And that's that's approach from largely Jungian and Freudian perspectives, uh, among others. But those are two of the predominant ones that we see in Western um, treatment of psychological conditions. So is that effective? I mean, I think we can objectively look at that and see that, it, yes, it can be effective, but there are huge gaping holes in that approach that um, don't necessarily alleviate the, the root causes of the problems. So they recur and recur and recur. When we look at the Eastern approach to health, generally speaking, it tends to be more systemic in its, um, in its approach uh, to looking at everything as sort of a, a unified essence. You know, how does everything affect and play into whatever issues may be arising? It, it tends to orient itself towards preventative care and preventative medicine. Um, it emphasizes the use of natural um, treatments, herbs, acupuncture, and finding balance, both energetic and spiritual. So we see uh, practices like Qigong, uh, external and internal Qigong, uh, acupuncture, acupressure. Um, and we look toward, in, in, in terms of the psychological and the mental, it's really very tied to the spiritual, and you really don't see a lot of that when it comes to um, the Western approach. It's very segmented. So you have spirituality over here, you have mental health over here, you have physical health over here. And, and uh, traditionally, they don't cross over very much, but I mean, it's relatively obvious that it does. So the Eastern approach really tends to be more unified. Um, if you look at the approach to mental conditions and how we can manage thoughts and our thought processes, um, there are different methods by which we can do that. Out of Buddhism, the, the Four Noble Truths and the Eightfold Path, very comprehensive method of managing the thoughts and understanding um, through self-examination, um, one's drive impulses. Uh, the Tao Te Ching, uh, essentially a, a life guide to where we can look at the alignment with nature and how we fit in with nature and in doing so find greater harmony in our lives. Um, and so we look at the divisions and examination of, of the material and spiritual existence and then how that moves us toward liberation. And my experience has been that, um, you know, while, while there are certainly multiple sects and, and strong feelings about how, you know, one approach should take precedence over another, so different divisions of Buddhism, different divisions of Taoism, um, there, there are those, and a substantial number of them, who really kind of don't worry too much about those divisions, but uh, it, it takes, you know, some of you guys know that I teach Jeet Kune Do, Bruce Lee's art, and, and it's more of that approach of, let's not really throw the baby out with the bathwater, but let's examine all of these paths and recognize the commonalities and recognize the strengths and utilize what works and then disregard what doesn't. That tends to be my guiding philosophy. And um, of course, there's, a, there's an inherent assumption that we have the capacity to reason and to be open enough to truly consider multiple paths. Um, so openness is one of the uh, prerequisites for being able to I think, uh, move in this direction. Now, <clears throat> when we look at stages of evolution and we look at kind of the stages of our life, 
um, what I'm going to emphasize today as a path that comes from Hinduism, and it, but I think it, it it really separates and segments these different components of our life experience so that we can isolate them a little bit uh, more easily, and we can begin to really look at those individualized components and see are we fulfilling our necessary actions as we we're in these various phases of life and experiencing these phases of life. So there are four primary uh, categories to this approach. One is called artha, which has to do with the pursuit of wealth, the material, and kama, the pursuit of pleasure. Well, this this is you know desire in, in the Buddhist world, and but when these are pursued unconsciously, we're entrenched in Maya or dukkha suffering. Um, and I think we can all pretty much uh, agree that when you're entrenched in the world of hedonism, I mean, where all you're doing is satiating those bodily urges. Yeah, there's kind of no end to the obsession. It just keeps going and going, and it's it's never ending and unquenchable. And there's something that is always missing. Uh, there's something that just won't stop tugging at you. I mean, now you can be unconscious and make yourself unconscious with external aids, booze, drugs, sex, what have you, but there's still going to be something under that that will be tugging. It will be saying, that's not quite all of it. That's not quite it. And so, so this is dharma. It's the calling and the intention of the soul. This is the path. Uh, so we, we talk about the path a lot. You know, the Tao being the path in both sort of a, a major and minor scheme. Um, and when we look at the calling of the soul, the, the path to this freedom, that takes you know, multiple ways in which we can, we can approach that, that issue, leading, of course, to what's referred to as moksha, which is freedom from conditional existence, unity, oneness with the Tao, enlightenment, if you will. So... Those are the four primary categories um, as humans that we're typically concerned with. Now, if you look at the Dharma, and we hear that that phrase or that term uh, quite frequently, particularly in Buddhism, um, if you look at so Hindus look at it from the perspective of these various stages. If we look at Satadharma, it's it's the actualization of our potential in each of life stages. So what it's looking at, you know, I feel very much aligned with the Tao, is that we have stages in life. And these stages in life are characterized by different life experience. And how can we make the most of those stages? How can we accomplish what's necessary in those stages and acknowledge our assets and our liabilities and bring them to play so that we can flourish and that we can move easily and readily to those that next stage, that next path. So uh, uh, one of the... Um, one of the analogies that's drawn is that of uh, you know, the oak tree. It basically says that if you're an oak tree, be an oak tree, and you will bear acorns. But if you're an oak tree, you're not going to bear peaches. A peach tree bears peaches. So it's essentially saying don't try to force yourself into being something that you're not. The acceptance of what you are, who you are, is an integral component to growth. Um, when I started martial arts, I started teaching. I I was concerned that no one would really want to learn anything from me, particularly when it came to you know, the teachings of the Eastern philosophy that I 
strongly embraced because I'm not Asian. And, um, you know, I had this image of a Mr. Miyagi figure that imparted wisdom and um, that, you know, just some dude from Kentucky wouldn't really be fitting the bill for that. But that doesn't matter. It, knowledge is knowledge. Experience is experience. It can be passed on from anyone. And uh, embracing and accepting that I'm a dude from Kentucky who just has learned from many others, um, wonderful teachers. And, and I, can, I can share that information. I can share that in the way that's appropriate for me being a dude from Kentucky. So I don't have to assume an affectation or try to pretend to be something that I'm not. I just am you know, a Popeye, I, I am what I am, but I can certainly grow as this individual and I can grow at different stages in my life based on those stages and, and recognize where to place effort appropriately so that I can kind of ride the wave, if you will, rather than trying to swim upstream. If we look at Ashrama Dharma, that's the fulfilling of those developmental stages. And in um, you know, Hinduism, it's referred to as the student, you know, these are the English translations, obviously, but the student, household, or retired, and renunciate. Uh, so if you look at our early stages of life, we're all students. You know, we have to go to school with children. We're learning about life, learning about simple life lessons. And then yeah, we move through our educational process whatever that may be, um, <clears throat> whether it's in academic institutions or in trades or whatever case we choose to pursue as individuals, but we're certainly students, and I know that I'm a student all through my life, but there's a particular emphasis on that in the early stages of life. A householder is somebody who is um, just um, making our way in life. So we're pursuing, um, as those earlier stages we're referring to, we're uh, pursuing wealth, we're pursuing station, we're uh, kind of creating relationships, we're um, um, uh, propagating and having children, and uh, if that's you know in our path, but we're moving through that stage of life of as we kind of establish ourselves. Somewhere later, we retire from that. And that generally uh, tends to be a time for, uh, that's associated with recreation, of, the, of freedom. And then uh, in the, from the Hindu perspective is the renunciate, uh, spiritual pursuit. Um, that's ascetism, where um, you know, in the extreme form, where you give up everything, and your entire life's dedication is to spirituality and union back to the oneness, to the unity from which we came as we come to the end of our lives. Now, Varna Dharma is the interpersonal responsibilities within family, community, nation, and world. So this is part of ashrama dharma and part of savad uh, savadharma as well so all of these uh, are, are parts of these components and forgive me uh, for anyone who um, is familiar with sanskrit if my pronunciations are not square on sorry i'm from kentucky from kentucky and have not studied sanskrit so there you go and then lastly, <clears throat> Rita Dharma, which is cosmic order, the, the calling of the divine principle and the law of underlying all things, spirituality and caring for the soul. So all of these combined, <clears throat> pardon me, these are, these are how we come to unity, how we come to oneness, and that we fulfill our potential as humans in this life. Um, to me, this makes great sense. 
And it also makes great sense that we don't squander our opportunity and live unconsciously in the pursuit of wealth and pleasure and kind of bury our heads in the sand. But we, we do open and we do recognize the opportunities that lie before us so that we can grow and expand as we move through life. Now, um, there's a wonderful book called Path to the Soul from Ashok Bedi, who, um, th these are Hindu principles, but he's a Hindu uh, physician who's a, a psychiatrist. And uh, he's done a wonderful job of unifying Jungian, psych Jungian psychiatry with um, the Eastern perspective to mental health. I really like what he's done. He does a lot of work with chakras and opening of the chakras. And so he's, he's fully acknowledging the Eastern pathways, these energetic pathways, while at the same time uh, really embracing uh, the path of mental health when it, comes to, um, when it comes to more of the Western perspective. And uh, for me personally, I feel it's a merger of those two worlds that is the most logical. And uh, I'm kind of an example of that because, uh, believe me, I've had uh, lots of opportunity to practice because I was a freaking lunatic when I was a young guy. And um, in order to pull myself together, I had to go through a lot of these processes in order to um, to right the boat, so to speak, and uh, come back to a state of balance. So I hope you found that useful. And uh, if I'm able to, I'd love to come back and uh, you know talk a bit further about these paths and uh, and how this process of evolution has aided me. And hopefully, it will be useful to some of you. Thanks. Thank you, Ed. Uh, it's great to uh, get back to that old uh, routine of uh, presentations, uh, you know, at least for me. For those of you who are encountering Sifu Ed online for the first time today, uh, he and I met uh, roughly uh, 15 years ago, uh, quite some time back. Uh, now you heard him mention Bruce Lee's teaching. Uh, the connection there is that Sifu Ed is actually a second generation student of Bruce Lee. That is to say, uh, his master is Jerry Petit, who learned directly from Bruce Lee and became an amazing martial artist himself. So all of them, from Bruce Lee to, to Jerry to, to Ed, they have all combined East and West in interesting and synergistic ways. Uh, for instance, Bruce Lee was known for incorporating uh, boxing techniques, Western training techniques into his art. So when I, uh, when I heard Ed's topic today about expansion and evolution, I, my mind immediately, immediately goes back to a Bruce Lee quote when Bruce Lee once upon a time said, when the opponent expands, I contract. When he contracts, mm -hmm. I expand. So today, uh, you can tell from his presentation that Sifu Ed is very much interested in the mind-body connection. Uh, that's actually part of his work, part of, part of his uh, professional interest as a professor at UCLA. Uh, he teaches at UCLA in addition to teaching martial arts at his own school, which is the Ekata Training Center all in Valencia. So he's definitely combining the various aspects of his life uh, in everything he does. Our meeting has come to an end, but the journey continues on. Let us travel safely. Until next time, may the Tao fill you with peace and happiness.